Good morning, everybody. It's nice to see everybody in the room. So this morning, um, I'm just going to give an overview of our integrating co-production into Bright Life at all levels. We have Sue Downham from our team, who is one of our social prescribing coordinators. And Sue is going to give a, a social prescriber's perspective and examples of personal experiences. And we're joined today as well by Tracy, Pete and Holly from Changing Lives Together in Cheshire, who uh, provide a buddy and befriending scheme. And they're going to be talking about the outcomes achieved through co-production and how they use it in their model. So Bright Life have been delivering social prescribing since 2015, when social prescribing was new in many areas and many health and other colleagues were unaware of the benefits and how to refer in. Our social prescribing predated the evolution of the NHS link workers and it's provided a model of good practice. As with all Aging Better projects, co-production has been key throughout, from inception to project delivery, Older people have been involved and consulted on all aspects of Bright Life work. And we'll explain more about that as we go along. So just quickly for people who may not know, what is social prescribing? So it's estimated that one in five of the people who go to see their GP are troubled by things that can't be cured by medical treatment. GPs say that they spend significant amounts of time dealing with the effects of poor housing, debt, stress and loneliness. Many people are overwhelmed and can't reach out to make the connections that could make a difference to their situation. This is especially true for people who have long-term conditions, who need support with their mental health, who are lonely and isolated, and social isolation is the key focus for ageing better or who have complex social needs that affect their well-being. And so that's where a social prescriber, a link worker, community connector, well-being coordinator, whatever the name of the worker and the role that it comes under, we can help people to identify what matters to them and then work out together how to connect with the activities that might make a difference. Next slide, please, Lynn. So just a little bit about Cheshire West and Chester, the area that we live in. It covers approximately 350 square miles and about a third of the population live in rural areas, which is quite a significant um, number of people. <clears throat> the number of people aged 85 or over is forecast to more than double to 20,000 by 2035. And 57% of adults are living with one or more long-term condition. So as with everywhere, there are towns, cities, villages with a wide range of socio-economic um, areas and health considerations. And I can assure you not everybody lives the Cheshire set lifestyle. <laughs> For social prescribing since 2015, we've had over a thousand referrals of which three quarters have progressed to an active and engaged stage and other people have received information and advice. Mm. Of those active participants, 73% of the people that we work with or have worked with are aged 70 plus. So we have received a lot of referrals and people contacting us for self-referrals from that older age range. With a small team, we don't deliver across the county, so we're targeted on specific locations. And for this last year of the project, we're working in two rural areas. Next slide, please. So the key elements of Bright Life social prescribing fitting in with the ageing better demographics. Social isolation is our key element for people aged 50 plus and about involving older people at all levels. By providing person-centred support, it means that the person is involved in every decision and their wishes, aspirations and the challenges are paramount to the outcomes that we can jointly work towards. Supporting individuals to take greater control of their health and well-being is a passion for us and it is 
that wide um, range of well-being and people's health, physical health and mental health is greatly um, inspired and becomes more positive and active as they become involved in different activities. Next slide, please, Lynn. After meeting challenges early on in getting health professionals referring in and trusting the service, we also met difficulties in how participants could be provided with support through our model. So for instance, the original models set time limits in numbers of weeks for engagement, but many older people were requiring maybe hospital admissions, they had became poorly, um, or they had um, issues that affected their ability to engage. And so after taking this into consideration and working with people, we changed our model so that includes the number of contacts and not the time limits. And that in enables a more person-centered support and flexibility for providing the support. And Pam Albright, who is a care facilitator in Winsford, which was one of the towns that we worked in, provided this quote for us, saying that by involving your service, allows users to get support and direction, often for the first time in their lives. By getting this support means that they can be supported to join in with activities of their choice and make social links within the community. This often then reduces people's health deterioration and the need of becoming reliant on first line services. And so although there's a movement to gather evidence for social prescribing on the savings that can be made to health, it's recognised by individuals and there is a growing movement around social prescribing and the health benefits. From the beginning, Bright Life has been committed to co-production, the meaningful involvement of older people, not just a token inclusion. Co-production at Bright Life has been facilitated by an advisory group called the Older People's Alliance or the OPA, a group of individuals with a wide range of skills and career backgrounds. Mm. Social prescribing was guided by a working group mm. consisting of members of our OPA, health professionals, local authority, public health, CCG and partner voluntary sector organisations. And this governance, including our OPA, ensured that our ethos to enable people aged over 50 to be more engaged in the design of services for their communities was adhered to. This is a quote from Margaret, who says, most of my later work in life, I was involved in the training of carers and I always believed I knew what was best for older people. However, when I got old myself, I realised I had done some things incorrectly. My assumptions about the needs of older people had been mine alone. It was a life-changing experience when I became involved with Bright Life as a volunteer on the social prescribing working group. I realised the voices of older people had to be heard and shared before any decisions could be made. If you don't involve them in a partnership, it is more than likely the outcomes will not be sustained. I think there's really powerful messages in, in Margaret's words there. And also the next slide is from Rihanna, who says, I had a career in health and social care and I am passionate about older people's services and approaches to health and wellbeing. I want to continue driving culture change in both communities and organisations in order to improve and maintain good health and wellbeing for older people. Being part of Bright Life enabled me to ensure my views and those of older people were being heard. And for the rural communities especially, where social isolation is a particular concern. And when you think back to the demographics that a third of our population and a third of our area is rural, then that really resonates. And both Margaret and Rhiannon have been involved not only in the working group, but they've worked alongside me in recruitment for social prescribing coordinators and sat on interviews as well. So it's been really good having them involved for us. Next slide, please. Everything for each participant and us starts with a conversation. And as the song goes, let's start at the very beginning. 
And so I'd like to introduce you to Sue Downham, one of our social prescribing coordinators, who will tell you about the co-production that we encourage with each and every person. Thanks, Sue. Thanks, Chris. Good morning, everybody. So uh, working in co-production is really the essence of what we do as social prescribers. The psychologist Carl Rogers was the developer of person-centered therapy, and he underpinned this with his seven core values. And these are, new slide please, thank you. Individuality, independence, privacy, partnership, choice, dignity, and respect. And although we're not working in a therapeutic setting, we use these key principles when working with individuals. And I sometimes think we use them unwittingly and instinctively. And as Chris says, it starts from the very beginning. So it starts with a conversation. New slide, please. My opening line is always, tell me about yourself. So taking a person right back to where they were born, where they grew up, talking about their family history, what they did for a living, what hobbies they enjoyed and so on. And for me, capturing a person's life story is so meaningful to them, even if they encounter bad times, which as we know, goes with life's territory. So it goes without saying that the role requires sensitivity, empathy, and confidentiality. So encouraging people to talk, giving them a voice, making them feel valued, ultimately builds trust and in turn confidence in themselves and whatever we are trying to achieve together. And many people recount, recount memories that they've actually forgotten about and they often include significant milestones, achievements and during that conversation they may highlight events, hobbies and activities that they may have done in the past. So after building trust and working together with participants we can pull information and ideas and come up with solutions together which can be really empowering. But I also like working with other organisations too and working with others towards a common goal of supporting a person to have a better quality of life within their own circumstances. And I say that because people have varying issues that with the best will in the world, none of us can change. So we work with other charities on a regular basis. New slide, please, Lynn. So when finding solutions um, for an individual, it sometimes requires myself to be flexible because we never know what we're going to encounter. And I also may have to negotiate or rather encourage other organisations to be flexible too. So I'm going to talk to you about Jean. Um, Jean is a 78 year old lady who I worked with um, and she was a widow um, and she had the onset of dementia. She lived alone and she had the capacity to do so. Um, her social worker and GP were keeping a watchful eye on her. Her daughter lived abroad and, and she didn't have any family nearby. She didn't drive um, and she was really nervous about using public transport because of her memory issues. Um, and, and I think she was actually advised not to. So I referred Jean to the Alzheimer's side by side befriending service, but they had been inundated with referrals um, and there was no immediate match. So Jean really wanted to go to a group. Um, and I knew that the Alzheimer's Society were running a coffee and chat at the Ben Bay Cafe, which was in, within Chester Zoo. And Jean had already told me that she loved animals um, and that she was a former member of the zoo. But however, the group was predominantly for people with dementia and their carers to go along together. Um, but I took Jean along whilst we were waiting for a befriender um, and she loved it. Um, and just to set the scene, the, uh, the, the cafe was sandwiched between the elephant enclosure and the warthogs. Um, so it was great to see her reaction when she walked in each time. Um, she joined in with the activities and she was really interested in the talks that the zoo rangers gave. And I was really happy to carry on taking Jean, um, but due to workload demands and no befriender found, I kind of really needed to find a solution. Uh, so I approached the a facilitator whom I had a really good relationship with um, and I asked her if there's anything that she could do. Um, and she told me that she could really see that Jean was enjoying uh, the visits 
Um, and she may be able to find a volunteer driver who could, who could uh, pick Jean up, drop her off and then pick her up later. And she could find a volunteer to sit with Jean uh, for the duration of the meeting. Um, so eventually after badgering Caroline, um, uh, the organiser, she, uh, she rang me and she said, I have found a driver. Um, he isn't local and we can't guarantee that he can take Jean to, to every meeting. Uh, but I had the driver with Jean and we went to her, uh, we drove from her house, I accompanied her to the, the cafe um, for, a first, for a first few visits, just to make sure she was comfortable with the driver and she could familiarise herself with him. Um, I think we actually took a picture of him put next to a calendar. Um, and fast forward to the end of the story and Dave, the driver, not only took her on a regular basis, but he stayed with her throughout the duration of the meeting. And to quote Dave, um, he said, um, it was so amazing to see Jean enjoy the meeting. I felt I couldn't let her down and I really enjoy the experience of supporting her. So with a bit of flexibility, we could achieve great outcomes together. But some people don't like to join groups, um, but they want and they need human contact. Next slide, please, Lynn. So let's talk about Betty. Betty was a 93 year old lady, um, a widow of 30 years. And she never had children and she only had two cousins that weren't local um, and they used to visit occasionally but they were also elderly and, and not in good health um, so she relied on home food deliveries she lived in a first floor flat with no lift um, and there were four flights of, of stairs that she had to negotiate and they were those see-through stairs you know the ones that you feel that you're going to slide through um, so she was basically confined to her flat Betty was a proud lady and though a little unsteady on her feet um, she'd never admit it and she was adamant that she wouldn't have a pendant alarm or any aids around the home um, despite me pointing out the benefits to her. So um, she was she was petite, serene and elegant and always wore a lipstick and beautiful colourful blouses that she some of them she'd made herself um, and she told me she was never she'd never been a joiner in her her and her husband, Jeffrey, um, always ever, always just did things together. Um, so Bright Life were waiting for a new befriending service to be commissioned. Uh, so I visited Betty on a regular basis, really to check on her well-being. I supported her with writing letters um, because her sight was deteriorating through macular degeneration. We did crosswords together. I ran the odd errand. Um, I found a charity that picked up an old piece of furniture that she no longer needed. Um, I think I even unblocked her sink once. Um, we found a, a, a cleaner together and I managed to retrieve our LPs from a, a high shelf within her wardrobe and she found her record player. So we danced around the living room to Mario Lanza, Carmen Miranda and an Austrian Sydney orchestra, where I think we did a rendition of the waltz to that. Um, and we laughed together and she taught me the lyrics to the British Grenadier Guard song, which I know is really random, but there's another story to that, which I haven't got time to tell you. Um, but she, she liked to share her stories and she always insisted I had a chocolate from her letterbox hotel chocolat collection um, before I left. Um, other chocolate manufacturers are available. Um, so it sounds like a hard job mine, doesn't it? But, um, uh, but the whole point is that she had someone to share her time with. She came alive. And when Bright Life commissioned the wonderful befriending service Changing Lives Together, who you're going to meet very soon, um, Betty, they found Betty a wonderful match, um, a person who became her friend, her confidant, and really looked out for her, and someone she trusted completely. So I think it's the right move advert that the tagline is find your happy. Well, Betty definitely found her happy. Back to Chris. Thanks, Sue. And would you like to tell us a little bit about how the dropping groups evolved and what people were asking for and how we set those up? Yeah, so another part of my role is to look at gaps in activities. Um, and a few of my participants that lived in a specific area in Chester wanted to go to a group and there wasn't one available. So Margaret York, the marvellous lady that Chris has mentioned um, earlier in the presentation, 
and who's been a stalwart for Bright Life, um, mentioned to me that there was a, a pub that was due to reopen in that area. Um, it was due to be demolished, um, but a community group had saved it, which is a fab fabulous story in itself. So one day I took a chance and drove to it and I saw that the door was open. And I walked in and saw that there was a meeting in progress. Um, I kind of apologised and uh, they said, no, no, come in, who are you? Um, and I explained about the project uh, and that I wanted to set up a drop-in. And without hesitation, they said, yes, we want this pub to be a community hub and Bright Life are welcome. So the rest is history and I, it was a privilege to get to know all the participants. And I'm really glad to say that thanks to our wonderful engagement and volunteer manager, Lynn Humphreys, we have three amazing volunteers that now facilitate the group, or at least they will do off post-COVID. Um, so uh, here's a little film that we want to share with you. <laughs> original proposal the concept for the drop-ins was that, that people would literally just drop in to get some information about what's going on in their area the things that they'd like to get involved in and then that person could go off or they could ask for some support to access the groups that they wanted to quite quickly we realized that that wasn't actually working very well people were asking for something very social. They didn't want to go to a formal group, but they wanted to reconnect with people in their community, in their location. It started off with three people, and it's just evolved into an amazing group of people that come along. We get 20 to 30 people coming along each time. Uh, people that didn't know each other before, and they've made friendships. I've had people that have gone on holiday with each other, so today, We've done a quiz, they always look forward to that, and the group have really gelled well together. It's been great. I lost my husband, and I got in touch with Brightlight, and I spoke to Catherine, and she said to come along to one of these. It's made me more confident that I can go out a little bit more and mix with more people. It's just wonderful. I come here for company. I come here to learn of people. When we play games and we talk to people and that's what, that's what life is all about. For many people that first step is the most difficult one to take and having that trusted relationship with the social prescriber has been key. I love coming here because um, my husband was ill, seriously ill with leukaemia a few years ago and I felt I had nobody to turn to at home and I wanted to join in with people and to join something like this gave me a few friends. I think people feel comfortable um, if they know the place they've got to go to but the importance is to have somebody, a volunteer with the people who aren't quite so confident about attending drop-ins and introduce them to people who they know who look after them. We always have a good laugh. <laughs> And we like, I like the quizzes because usually if Lynn does them, they're easy <laughs> and it doesn't matter whether you get them right or wrong. Also it gets you out, doesn't it? And you meet other people and that's it, it meets a lot of people. I've met a lot of people here. Today is like all the other days, very enjoyable and loads of lovely company and we have a lot of laughs as well. It's good fun. The worst thing you can do as you get older is not to go out. It's going out and meeting people that keep you keep your, your, your mind going. What basically happened is my wife had a cardiac arrest, lost a uh, lot of memory. But here you can talk to people and in some cases you can remember what she said as well. This opens up to the world again. We've recently done a little survey and from that 98% of people said that from coming to our groups they felt more confident in accessing other social groups now um, and some of the comments have been lovely about why they value the group so it's been really really successful.
Lynn. And now, um, I mean, from the groups, you can see that people enjoyed themselves and people contributed. They made the decisions about what activities were going to happen at the groups and uh, have also helped to arrange some trips out. Um, and our wonderful OPA have been helping out with different groups um, and really been involved in that. And one of the ladies in that film, Christine, she actually became a befriender for our Buddy and Befriending Scheme with Changing Lives Together. And I'd like to introduce Tracy now, who is going to tell you about their scheme. Thanks, Tracy. Hi, thank you, Christine, and thanks very much for the opportunity to join the event today and talk about our uh, Buddying and Befriending scheme. Um, so we had an amazingly positive experience with the Bright Life team from the word go, really. Um, it was clear that they had some concerns and reservations from a previously unsuccessful scheme, and they were keen for themselves and ourselves to obviously communicate effectively throughout the process um, and to establish a good rapport, which was obviously the, um, the good ground for setting up the scheme in the first place. They also, the Older People's Alliance were extremely supportive as well, right from the tender stage really. And we had an assigned representative who was not only interested and enthusiastic, but encouraging and supportive and gave us guidance on our progress, which helped. Um, one of the really useful things was our contract meetings that we had with Bright Life. They were obviously official and focused on performance because that was one of the main aspects of the service. But they had a test and learn approach and they were held quarterly and we covered things sort of what we'd learned over the past quarter, what had gone well, what we could change and who we've linked in with to ensure that the client was um, the focus of, what, of everything that we were doing throughout the project really. We also set up some really good um, social prescribing team meetings with Bright Life which were um, absolutely excellent and these were more informal discussions with the team who were making the direct referrals to our service and project and included um, some case conferences about clients um, we could talk about all of the good things that were happening with the project and highlight the successes that we'd achieved each quarter and the impact this was having on clients and for both parties really for the Bright Life team and for changing lives this was really key so that we could we could feed back all of the good things about the clients that were happening and all of the impact that it was having on their lives and all of the matches that we'd, we'd achieved so far. Um, I'll pass over to Pete now, who's going to talk, talk sorry, not chalk, talk, <laughs> talk about our, our referral process and how um, co-production um, really did affect the clients. Hello, everyone. Again, thank you for inviting us today. Um, I want to start off really by talking about the initial process and our referral process, which we put together with Bright Life. It's a secure process that uh, meant that we could get a good amount of detail and um, background about the clients before we made our initial call. Um, the social prescribers would know those people better and be able to give us an outline. It also meant that we could have a friendly approach by knowing a little bit about them, a little bit of background, so we could have a chat with them about common common things that they liked and enjoyed um, before we arranged to meet them. So that initial call always went ahead as well. There's always an option on the form as well, for as well as a referral form for the social prescriber to have a conversation with us, and we often did, uh, to chat about that client prior to us speaking to them and planning a visit. All that meant that we, Gain the trust, I suppose, of, of, of the client, and that meant that they, you know, they trusted Bright Life to trust us uh, to call them and arrange a meeting with them. Um, in some cases, and in many cases, um, we would actually attend with the uh, the social prescriber uh, to meet the client. So we'd arrange that. I think that was a good idea because. Obviously, the social provider had already met the, the person as well, and it meant that they, they felt comfortable in an environment where they knew at least one of the two people coming into their home or wherever we were going to meet them. They could be quite long. They could be an hour to an hour and a half. Um, the reason for that is because we wanted to be a friendly environment, a chat rather than an interview, so we could talk to the clients and get to know and establish a relationship with us because they already had that. Um, with the social prescriber, but to, to enable us to then gather interests and hobbies and get to know that person to let us have a better idea of who to match because our matching process means that we don't just match anyone with anyone. It, it's a case of looking at their interests and their preferences, 
small things like whether they would like to be matched with a male or a female volunteer, things like that. And we would do a matching, we'd have a matching form. It'd be quite an informal process. And part of the chat would be me filling the form in as we're talking through that as well. Um, we'd also be able to find out what they wanted to achieve from the buddy and befriending scheme and what they, what they would actually prefer and to build their confidence in before actually meeting the volunteer for the first time. So all those things put together were to put the, the client at ease, build a relationship with us that we didn't have at the time, um, and then move forward to, towards, you know, matching them up with a suitable volunteer. Um, Holly's going to take over and tell you the next part. Thanks, Pete. Holly. Thank you. So Pete's obviously talked about the process of building a relationship with the client and I'm going to go on to talk about the process of selecting the right volunteer for the befriending match. So for us, the first part of that process was meeting a prospective volunteer face to face after we'd had an inquiry from them. So we would set up a one-to-one -one meeting where we would meet with the person, um, generally spend about an hour with them. And it was a chance for them to sign up to the service for us to give them plenty of information about friending, about the service in general, um, complete some forms with them. But it was also, to borrow Sue's phrase, from before a bit of a tell me about yourself session, a chance for us to find out about each person we met with, um, what their interests were, their motives for volunteering, why they picked befriending in particular. And we would do that over the space of about an hour. Following that, the next stage of the process would be to ask each prospective volunteer to attend a training session. And the training session would always be held in a small group and it would last around four hours in total. So as well as obviously giving people information which would prepare them for their roles, it was a chance for Pete and I to get a bit more of an understanding of each person's character, see how they were in the group, how they interacted with other people, whether they were a more chatty character or if they were more of a listener. It was a brilliant way for us to get a chance to see which client they might be a good match for. And we were thinking about that constantly while we were doing training and we'd have a discussion after each training session about which volunteer we were going to try and match with each client that we've got waiting. So that was the next process. Following this, we would set up um, an introductory meeting between a client and a volunteer and either Pete or I would take the volunteer to see the client normally in their home and have a chat with them, introduce the volunteer, give them a chance to ask questions of each other, get to know each other a little bit and the role of Pete and myself in that situation was to just make them both feel as comfortable as possible because it could be very nerve-wracking at first meeting, keep the conversation flowing, make sure they were getting chance to speak to each other, um, getting the balance right between us putting them at ease as the, the neutral person who knew them both um, and taking a step back and giving them space to talk to each other as well. Um, following that first introductory meeting, we were able to provide two more meetings where Pete or myself would go with the volunteer again to visit the client. However, a lot of the time, both the client and the volunteer would say, we don't need you, we got on really, really well, you can take a step back now, in which case, brilliant, and we would do that. Moving forward, once the match had been established, we would continue to support both the client and the volunteer. They both had our contact details and could get in touch with us if they had any questions, any issues, if anything had changed for them that they wanted us to know about. We had um, ongoing communications with the social prescribers who were brilliant with sharing any updates for us that were relevant. Um, they would contact us if they wanted to hear any feedback or updates from our side. So it was very much an ongoing communication system, very much two-way. Um, if there was ever a reason why a match needed to come to an end, if the circumstances of either the client or the volunteer had changed, then rematches could be done and we would put that in place for the client or for the volunteer. 
And it's worth mentioning that both Pete and I, as well as being coordinators, we'd each picked up our own befriending um, along the course of our volunteer coordinating. Both of us just people who we'd met during the initial visit with the social prescriber and just really clicked with and thought, I'd love to be your volunteer. And so we did. And we both feel that being volunteers as well as coordinators has given us a different perspective and helped us to understand what support volunteers really need for us um, so that we can take that back to our coordinating roles as well. And that's it from me, thank you. So we just want to have a talk about um, a couple of case studies that um, we both want to, wanted to chat about. Um, would you like me to go first, Holly? Yes, go ahead. So um, Mandy and David, were my, my choice, um, one that's quite close to my heart and to, for many different reasons. Um, I met David initially, we had the first phone call. In his own words, he was quite grumpy um, and he told me that and he told me so and he doesn't take to people like, uh, easily. Um, myself and Sue had already spoken about David. Um, so I had a couple of chats and I had a couple of phone calls with David actually before we met and then arranged to meet him with Sue, Sue Downham. And we went to his house. Um, lovely chap, um, very much um, set in his own ways. And quite rightly, I had to win him over because he, he wasn't someone who was going to take to it very lightly. Um, but he was a lovely chap. A um, lot of health problems. Um, and myself and Sue spent a good time sat with him and had a chat. Um, unfortunately, at the time when we went, he was uh, quite poorly and um, the surroundings weren't exactly suitable for one of our volunteers to, to go and visit at that time. I spoke to him afterwards as well, and um, we had a number of chats between myself and Sue over the coming weeks and realised it was going to take some time and a very special volunteer to match David with. We couldn't, um, it couldn't be just preferences and likes, but someone was going to have to understand um, how he can be sometimes. Uh, luckily, Mandy came across, uh, came, came along and instantly I thought of David because she was very open-minded, very chatty herself, very bubbly, but also would take people on face value and I felt could win anyone. If any, she could win anyone over, she could win David over. So we, we set up a meeting with the two of them. Um, Mandy was struggling to find the house on the day I was there. Um, and David told her, we, she was a little bit late, it was only about five minutes late, um, but David straight away told her how, how late she was and that she was supposed to be at a certain time, at which time mo a lot of volunteers would have been sort of hit or stumped by that, but Mandy hit back with a, a sort of laugh and a joke and said, well, I don't know where you live, I'll, I'll find it in the future, won't I? And they both laughed. Um, and at most of that meeting was the two of them chatting, it was great to see. And my thoughts were right, she won him over. Um, they were absolutely matched perfectly together and still are to this day, they're still good to this day. Um, it was only about a month later, I was receiving photographs from uh, Mandy's showing that he'd had his hair cut and, and she'd managed to arrange a hair, hairdresser for him. He had a big smile on his face. For the first time since I had been visiting him, I saw him smiling then and laughing, which which is lovely to see from anyone um, and a fantastic outcome as well. Um, on another visit when I went back to take some photographs at Christmas that they both agreed to for a, a publication that I picked up on this story, um, they, they were laughing and joking like old friends. They've had a parrot. Uh, I was there first and as soon as Mandy walked through the door, it was shouting out Mandy's name. So even the parrot had taken to Mandy, who also doesn't take to everyone and usually swears at them not to Mandy. Uh, so we all whistle and call an email. All in all, their friendship has just grown. Um, it, it's more than just a befriend uh, or more than just a role for Mandy. They're, they're good friends. And I think she sees David as a bit of a father figure and really cares about him. And it's just such a lovely outcome. And that's from me. Over to you, Holly. 
Thanks, Pete. So I am going to talk about Kathy and Betty, and everyone will recognise Betty's name because by coincidence, she is the client who Sue talked about earlier also. Um, Sue and I realised that we were going to be talking about the same person and thought it might be nice for people to get an idea of um, the match from both the social prescriber's side and from the volunteer and the volunteer coordinator's side as well. So Sue referred Betty to our service and Betty was one of the first Bright Lab clients I ever met. Sue had sent us a lovely refer referral with loads of information about Betty and gave a real, like, real idea of what a character she is. Um, so I went with Sue and met Betty for the first meeting. Um, I knew that she was, like I say, quite a character, very, very independent lady, but at the same time, she did have some things that she could do with a little bit of help for. She had issues with her eyesight. She was struggling to read anything for herself, including things like her catalogues and things which she liked to order things from and liked to look through in all the time she was in her home on her own. And we had a volunteer called Kathy, who was, is still um, a carer when she's not volunteering. And she's somebody who is naturally a very caring person, but she also has a very lovely way about her, is able to help people and offer help without coming across as pushy or taking away their independence at all. She just does it very, very naturally. Um, she's got a good sense of humour like Betty and they have been matched up for two years now. And from the very first meeting between the two of them where I introduced them, it was clear that it was one of those situations where they'd be perfectly happy if I wasn't there really. They just clicked, they got on really well. They have a similar sense of humour. After the first meeting, I called Betty to ask her how she felt things had gone with Kathy, and she said, oh yes, she's brilliant. She could use my tin opener, which I thought was just very typical of Betty, really. She's, um, she'd brought out a tin opener that she found impossible to use, and Kathy had said, oh, I'll do that for you, and did, and Betty had just remembered that. Um, just reflects who she is really as a person. She's got quite a dry sense of humour um, and Kathy just got her. They got on really well. Um, Sue mentioned that Betty is a widow and that she doesn't have children. Her support network is very, very small and the only people she really had contact with when I first met her were a couple of cousins who were elderly themselves. So She's had no contact with them at all over the past year because of lockdown. Um, and Kathy has been a huge support to Betty through this time. Um, and she helps her out with lots of little bits and pieces, um, as well as just being a support and a friend and a breath of fresh air in her life and somebody different to talk to. And they have a lovely relationship and are just genuinely very, very good friends now. Thank you. Thanks, Holly. I'm just aware of time and I know we're going to run over a little bit. I hope that's all right with people or that you've got. If you need to get away, then please do click off. Um, we have, we will be sharing the slides and there is um, a short three minute film showing some of the um, relationships um, between the clients and the befrienders, which is beautiful to watch. So I would encourage you to do that when you receive the slides. Um, we're just moving on quickly. Um, thanks very much to Tracy, Holly and Pete. Um, I think it really illustrates that co-producing with other organisations and with the people themselves you know, provide sustainable outcomes, really enjoyable outcomes for people. Just quickly, our top tips. Now, these are from our experiences and these are available on the Bright Life website. Um, and also there's lots of information around social prescribing um, and the whole Aging Better website has, also has a lot of information on it. 
We talked early on about right referrals um, and making sure that there's clear pathways so that people can know how to refer in. And it starts with a conversation and building the relationships. We like to address the person's concerns within a framework for part of positivity whenever possible. But we have to acknowledge that as particularly people who are vulnerable, they live in challenging situations. We have to take account of people's choices. It might not always be what we would think is best for them, but it's their choice. And we will work with them to get their best possible outcome. There is lack of provision in different places and mobility and transport are big things that impact on whether people can, can access the right activities. Homes it visits, we found people love us to come to their home and that works with befriending as well and their things they're comfortable there they like to show us the things that are around them and it helps to increase people's self-confidence next slide please lynn we saw in the film that everybody wants to join a formal group or activity and holly and pete and tracy have talked about how a good befriending scheme is so important and that warm welcome. We like to improve resilience um, whilst we're reducing isolation. And whilst I spoke about being able to make savings across the care pathway, we don't always be, a, we're not always able to evidence that well. And the people do like a, to have a purpose and those volunteering roles can be so enriching. And volunteering and social action are identified as key enablers for delivering the new relationship for health with people and communities and so reduce demand on GP services. And whilst we haven't used the words co-production very much, it's intrinsically linked to person-centred support and asset-based community development. And I think it's run like a golden thread all through the Bright Life programme and Aging Better. If you'd like to any more information, there's our website. We have the top tips for different areas of our project. And on our website, you'll find the YouTube channel and some podcasts where you can watch as well. The Changing Lives Together video and they also have one on volunteering and there are different ones from social prescribing and other projects. We'd love you to stay if you have any questions, answers, or if you'd like some discussion with us. Um, and we'll be back in just a couple of minutes. I look forward to meeting with some of you then. Thanks very much. Hello again, everybody. Um, we're going to go into a bit of a question and answer session now. Um, if anybody it wants to raise anything, if you want to put it in the chat or by using the reactions button um, down at the bottom of the uh, Zoom screen, uh, you can do a raise hand. Does anybody want to start us off with any questions? Jemima, would you like to unmute yourself, Jemima? That's classic. Um, <laughs> so um, I work, I, I'm based in Bristol and working on a pilot project where we're working with the council and using people's direct payments, which they normally are only allowed to spend on care to do something a little bit like social prescribing, where we do a bit of a process where we look at what's important to them and we try and find some services or some activities that they can get involved with. So it's not full social prescribing, but it's kind of a cousin to it. Um, and so my um, question really is, because I'm very new to it, obviously I know a certain amount about what's going on in Bristol, but I just wondered if you had any tips as social prescribers about how you research services, what you look for, anything at all, because sometimes I'm just on Google looking for things and um, I know a lot of it is about just building up that knowledge, but as someone's just starting out, just wondered if you had any tips. Yeah, I'll bring Sue in in a moment because Sue's um, one of our experts on this. But I think Googling gives you lots of information, doesn't it? But then you're not exactly sure how it works. Um, and so what we found is very much giving them a call, speaking mm -hmm. to the person, 
Um, and when we've been able to um, go out and visit and maybe join in the beginning of the session, making sure that there is a warm welcome for somebody. And I know that some of the other Aging Better projects have done a lot of work on that as well, because there's nothing worse than somebody plucking up the courage to go along somewhere and then they feel like they're not part of it and really awkward and they're never going to go again. Um, but I think a lot of places um, really would like to engage more, you know, to be able to involve more people. Um, and I know that direct payments is something that's being muted around in Cheshire as well. And mm -hmm. people to be able to access more than just care, basically. Exactly, yeah. Um, activities. Um, and I think for different organisations, so I know that, for instance, we're aligned with AGK Cheshire and like their day services, you know, that sort of thing. They would welcome people to come and visit, um, have taster session and then, you know, payment could be arranged after that. Um, and very much, I think. I feel as though groups in, in our area are looking forward to very much, obviously, to opening up and being able to do face to face again. There's a lot of online stuff that can be helpful if the person's able to access that. But that the face to face um, activities, people are seeing it as an, an opportunity to maybe, you know, reinvent what they were doing and to be able to have people involved very much in designing what they're going to be involved in. Mm. Sue, have you got any? Um, sorry, yeah. Sorry, I wasn't on, was I? Um, yeah, it's just, um, sorry, I, I, I've just got back that question, but I think um, Lynn and I did a bit of a road trip um, to look at what was out there, really, just going, just getting to know your area um, and going, going out and looking at, you know, going to village halls and churches and just to collate information from really what's out there. And I think once you get out there and you start talking to people um, and just just finding out what's what's going on that way, really. And uh, yeah, so we um, that was quite successful, Lynn, wasn't it? When we went out and we did a, a obviously it was just before lockdown, but we went out to see because I covered quite a big area big rural area and you know and there's always a church or a village hall or um but then you know it's not just about googling it is about sort of getting out there mm. and, and, and making connections really yeah yeah thank you yeah. i would say also jemima you know if you've been in bristol to maybe make contact with the link workers there because they yeah. have some information yeah. as well yeah yeah be able to work yeah in collaboration with them. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Jemima. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Chris. Uh, just as a follow on to that, how important is, is it to establish networks amongst other people doing similar roles? Um, and does that work where there's competition between organisations? Mm. I think it is really important to network. Social prescribing is about linking people into different things, whatever, you know, we can find that they want to join in with. Um, and I think that we've established yeah. in areas um, a peer support group with um, the different link workers and social prescribers um, and different organisations um, employ those people and it's bro broken a lot of barriers down. I think there's a lot of coordinated support now available, certainly in our area in Cheshire, West and Chester. And I think that within individual care communities or primary care networks, that can really work well. Um, and I think that that partnership working is a part of social prescribing. It, we do it at that personal level for a person and then it's taken up to the next level within your organisation. Um, Tracy, how do you feel about with social, uh, with budding and befriending? Because I know you've been in touch with, with other organisations and helped with training and, and worked in partnership. 
Yes, we have. I think that the communication and the networking and links with other organisations is really key. We are part of Befriending Networks, which is a national organisation and brings together lots of different organisations across the country that are delivering budding and befriending and associated services. And we found that extremely useful in terms of sharing good practice and training um, ideas, um, referral processes, etc. It's been absolutely key. And also linking with Age UK, Age UK developed a lot of our training initially as well, which was fantastic. Thanks, Tracy. Um, thanks, Harriet's just put something on the on the chat about linking in with local Facebook groups. Uh, helpful to know what's going on in terms of networking. I know I know we've done that uh, at Bright Life, and also uh, they have a database. Um, about you know if, if if you're setting something up or there's similar things going on uh, in Cheshire we have the um, Live Well website um, which which links everything going on um, we, we, we hope across Cheshire West and Chester uh, it's run by the by the local authority but it brings in lots of third sector groups lots of statutory statutory services um, and is a has been developed into a really good networking tool as well so I think that's really important to use what's available in terms of websites other social media that that sort of thing so um thank you for raising that harriet that's a really good point any any other questions i've got i've got one if um if uh we, we, we haven't got anyone else who wants to ask something we've got we've we've got a couple that have come through but it, it's about if we were and maybe this might be for tracy um and pete and holly uh, if we were creating an entirely new project, and of course we've been going through a process of test and learn throughout throughout our, our, the whole lifespan of Bright Life, um, but if we if we were starting something from scratch, say a budding and befriending scheme, would you wish to incorporate co-production from the beginning of that? And and if so, how how could this be done, or how would you go about uh, thinking about this? So yes, I'll start if that's okay. Yes, absolutely. I think it was it was key to the success of our project. Absolutely. Um, as for how it could be done, I think it's just going back to communication, effective communication with all of the partners that are involved. We found that that was the most useful thing, really. Obviously, with the client at the heart of everything that we do and involving them in all of the processes and the time spent with clients and with volunteers to achieve successful matches I think planning in um that into into your referral process is is really key Pete Holly I don't know if you've got anything to add to that yeah again I think the communication certainly with social prescribers as well it's building that to build a relationship with a client you have to have a relationship with whoever's referring that client um, and it all sort of keep matches in together so you gain a trust in you know each other in terms of social prescriber, for example, with ourselves, you know, it, it just enables that to be more fluid and more flow much, much better if you've got that communication between all parties. Thanks, Pete. Uh, Chris McClellan. Christine, if um, a commissioner asks you to evidence and prove that you co-produce as opposed to just doing what you think is the right way of doing things what evidence do you actually have how could you prove that okay so i think at different levels we've got the as we talked about the opa involvement and i think at a strategic and a practical level they've been key for bright life um and so i think the fact that they've joined in meetings that they've been involved in um setting up as margaret did helping give us information for setting up um drop-ins involved in recruitment and i think on a very individual level it would be around the action plans that people have um we don't go along with a list of things that are available in the area and say you can do this this or this let's just tick things off it, it very much comes from that person um i think the variety of things that we can find for people as much as possible um 
So I know that we did a piece of work um, for when we had the, um, the conference because Bright Life was originally due to end last year. And we had referred into, at that point, 297 different groups or activities for people. Um, and I think that's marvellous. I think that really shows we haven't got a list of 25 favourites or anything. It is very much coming from the person. Um, and I would feel confident about anybody talking to the team, to our OPA, to you know the governance that we've had, or to any of our participants to ask about that. And I think I've been really proud of the way that co-production has been used within the project. And I don't know whether any of our OPA who are on our call today would like to talk about that at all. Rhiannon, do you want to unmute yourself? Hi, yes, it's, it's been good to hear everything today. I've really loved it. And, uh, you know, it again, it's, it's, it's our story as OPA members. And, um, you know, we, we, we've we've moved along with you and I think we've each gone different ways. Um, I think for me um, to actually join Rural Alliance, which is social prescribing, link work, workers, well, befriending, all sorts of things. Um, the care in the community now, I've joined that again, which brings is going to bring rural communities closer together and, and have opportunities of co-production again, I think. So there's so much going on for me, I think. I mean, I'm passionate about the rural communities. Uh, my background um, acknowledged all of the social isolation that was there many, many years ago, possibly well before Bright Life. And I think for me to join Bright Life and come forward, come along with all of you has been amazing. But, but also for me to be able to jump onto the groups like Rural Alliance, you know, surgeries and other professionals attending, you know, hearing link workers, wellbeing coordinators and social prescribers give over their development and where they're going next. And, you know, the fact that they're working together and sharing, it's so important. That sort of education needs to be on the street for everybody. And, you know, that's what I hope to go forward with is to, you know, I mean, I attend the meetings and it's good for me to do that. But for me, it's how we get that back to the community. So they're aware of what is out there for them. So all of the older people and their carers, you know, to understand, you know, generally what is out there uh, that they can tap into, for me, is so positive for the future. Thanks. <laughs> That's great. Thank you very much, Rhiannon. Thanks. Really, really useful insight from one of our OPA members. Does anybody have any other questions or any other comments that they'd like to make? OK, wonderful. Um, just before we um, just before we finish, uh, I just wanted to um, mention on behalf of Vicky uh, a couple of the other a couple of the other events and things that are coming up um, this week. Uh, and indeed into um, into the coming weeks as well. Um, so uh, we've got a, a few different festival themes um, across this week. Um, obviously, we've been talking about social prescribing today. Um, we've also got a session tomorrow on um, commissioning um, and co-production in commissioning. And there's lots of different themes that you can see across there, um, tackling ageism, um, uh, coastal and rural areas in particular. Um, and running alongside all of this is the launch of the National Toolkit um, that the uh, co-production team have worked very hard on over the past, I want to say 12 months, but I think it's longer than that. So the toolkit kit is being launched throughout this week and throughout the subsequent weeks. Um, and there are places um, left on those sessions if you want to sign up to those through the Eventbrite. Um, and finally, there's a couple of um, additional sessions this week. Uh, so there's a dance session tomorrow morning, which I'm um, promised will be a very interactive session, although you don't have to have your cameras on apparently for that. So uh, if you want a little bit of uh, livening up early tomorrow morning, please look to join that. 
and then also uh, a couple of other events there, Net Network and NATA, and then Gather Town. Um, and the end of group reflections and celebration take place on Friday afternoon. Okay. Um, I think that's I think that's it from us. Uh, just on behalf of the Bright Life team, I'd like to say thank you very much for attending today. Thank you very much um, for our partners, uh, Changing Lives Together, for coming in on, on this and sharing their experiences as well. Uh, we will be sharing slides. I think that's going to have to be through the aging, uh, sorry, through the, um, the the festival team so those may well come out um via vicky or via paul but look out for those and they'll also be the recorded output as well thank you very much all for coming have a good day thank you, thank you.